Right. So uh, it's titled The State of Nature and the Nature of the State. But as I pointed out today, uh, what we are going to discuss in this first class is the state of nature, according to Thomas Hobbes. Now, uh, as I was suggesting, from the beginning of the century onwards, the idea of the divine status of the monarch as God's agent on earth was undergoing a kind of a question. There were fundamental questions being asked. What was the human state of nature like? How did human beings evolve into a state? How did human beings behave in togetherness and more importantly who possessed the rights was the right possessed only by uh, the monarch did the concept of absolute monarchy mean that the rights were alienated from the individual himself and finally, why did human beings organize themselves into a state? Now, you might ask me uh, a few questions here. And ask what were the primitive societies like? How did human beings organize themselves into a state? And what were the models of the state like? Now, as you are aware, this question of the primitivity of man and the primitive state of nature would mean purely existence for uh, the sake of existence and uh, self-interest. In that state, of course, there is no organization into society. People would hunt in packs. But this was a state of primitivity and degeneration which the Enlightenment would, of course, be very afraid of. Right. Now, we have, of course, models of the state emerging in early civilizations. In Europe, of course, the more important classical idea would, that, uh, would be that of the Greek state or the police, where you know people were supposed to be organized into political existence and that there were clear laws, modes and patterns of behavior. And therefore, uh, this would be the ideal to which uh, the, the, uh, the 17th century would probably look at. At the same time, as I was pointing out, certain very fundamental questions were being asked. What exactly did the divine right of kingship mean? Now, if the king was God's representative on earth, then there were no rights to the individual. You know, individuals were alienated from their rights, and all rights were subsumed within the body of the monarch. What if the monarch was not uh, was not a very egalitarian individual? What happened if the monarch came into conflict with his subjects? Would somebody be forced to obey him? Could somebody then rebel against him? Now, this came into forefront during the time of James. 1603 onwards and of course they would again come into greater uh, I would say focus once Charles the first came into power and Charles if you remember from our discussion earlier was an extremely unpopular monarch did not take parliament into cognizance and was therefore uh, stoking this element of conflict between the people and the sovereign. Therefore, there's always this debate about who the monarch was, 
what his rights were, what the subject could do, and whether any course of rebellion was possible if the monarch failed in his duties. So we are looking at two kinds of duties here. One is the duty of the subject, and the other is the duty of the monarch. Now, the other question that I would really like you to also ponder is this question of human nature. Now, you can, of course, see during the Enlightenment the movement towards the question of the body and the mind, the senses and rationality. Now, the Christian view of uh, the the Christian view of uh, the human state was articulated most positive, most uh, passionately, I would say, most violently, in a sense, by somebody like Calvin, who would argue that human nature is by itself fallen. That is to say, human nature is sinful, and therefore. We needed to be punished in order to improve or purify it. Of course, in the New Testament, it is Christ who takes upon himself the punishment to free human nature of its uh, evil. But once again, this question of evil, this question of uh, chaotic human nature, completely dominated by the senses is something that uh, we also need to take into cognizance when uh, we are discussing Hobbes. So you actually have a varied number of discourses floating around about the nature of the state and the human vis-a-vis -vis the State, the question of the state, uh, what was the relationship of the human with reference to the state? And the second thing is, what was human nature like? Was it sinful that human beings were by, by nature, they were sinful and they could be led to piety by religion? These were questions which were asked during the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance. And we're coming into the forefront, especially with a monarchy that was wobbling or that was having a crisis with its population. Now, where does the importance of Hobbes lie? Now, Hobbes, as I will very quickly point out, came from a range of disciplines. He was a philosopher, he was a mathematician. He was a physicist, but above all, I would say he was a materialist. And therefore, he suggested that to understand how people behave, it is important to understand why they behave in this way. Right. So he was providing a kind of a rational dissection of what human, the human state of nature was. And therefore, how that human state of nature could be organized into the concept of a state. into the nature of the state. Right. This is one fundamental question that he was asking. But why was he asking the question when he was asking the question? In what context was he asking this question? And that is where your timeline becomes important because you have seen that from 1625 onwards, you have a monarch who is unpopular, a parliament who is opposing this monarch. England is being compulsively rent into what I will call a bloody civil war. By 1642, when Hobbes has already started 
writing Leviathan in bits and pieces. This question, the civil war has broken out. And you see, between 1640 and 1651, Hobbes virtually was paralyzed due to the civil outbreak of the civil war. He could think of nothing else. And he was writing this entire tract in response to this. This was published in 1651, by which time, you see, something else has happened, that the king has been beheaded in 1649, and the parliamentarians are coming to power. So it's an interesting tract in the sense that Hobbes has started writing this during the period of the Civil War. But when he's publishing it, the Civil War has come to an end, and the parliamentarians have come to power, and Cromwell is on his ascent. Now, this is very important about the debates on Leviathan, which we'll talk about a little later on. But now that I assume everybody is here, I can now switch on to what I will call the slideshow mode and talk about our, our text, that is, Leviathan. Now, Hobbes, as you can see, starts off into in the Renaissance, and he lives a very, very long time, almost 100 years, uh, at least 90. And therefore, he has witnessed both the theory of the divine right of kingship, the reign of James, and also the era of Charles. And he's also looking at Cromwell and Charles II. So Hobbes is a man who has lived through English society in tremendous journey. So these are the political contexts of Hobbes, as you can see, the English Civil War outbreak in 1642. But even then, starting off from Charles's period onwards, ending with the beheading of Charles, in 1649, 1651 is Leviathan, 1653 approximately, Cromwell is the Lord Protectorate, 1658, Cromwell dies, 1660, the restoration of Charles II, Hobbes is living on all through this time. Now, Hobbes initially was the secretary to Lord Cavendish. Uh, he fled to France when, this is very important, he fled to France, especially Paris, when the civil war broke out. Right, He supported the royalists initially, and therefore, when he wrote in favor of the royalists, he anticipated being persecuted, therefore, he fled to France. He was there, the tutor to Charles II. So, it places Hobbes squarely, as it were, in the royalist camp. Right. And then he was, when Charles II came back, he was readmitted into court, given a pension. But, you see, being a materialist and writing a tract solely on the material human nature without much reference to God, Hobbes was very scared that his tract would be considered atheist. It was. In fact, during the Restoration, anybody who did not believe God and was a materialist was called a hobbyist. Right. Therefore, Hobbes was scared that you know his tract, and his tract was mentioned as one of those tracts which was atheist, and therefore it would be burnt. So Hobbes was fearing for his life when the monarch had come back. But along with that, what I want to emphasize is that Hobbes, in his own right, was an important mathematician. He, in fact, had conversations with the continental mathematicians of Italy and France, notably Pierre Gassendi. He interacted very, very robustly, I would say, with Descartes, often, you know, contradicting Descartes' prioritization of the mind, suggesting that 
you know, the body and its mechanisms were equally important. In fact, Descartes included Hobbes's objections in his text. They quarreled, they debated, respected each other, but had a falling out later on. Hobbes was also familiar with the scientific discourses of mechanics, optics, and therefore the material sciences uh, was a very important part of Hobbes's entire horizon of ideas. Why am I sort of going on and on with this? I want to lay before you two or three facts. Is that we cannot divorce Hobbes's writings from the political context in which he wrote. And that political context was squarely the English Civil War. He was responding to the questions that the English Civil War had thrown up. What were these questions? To what extent was the right of the king? What was the duty of the subject? What if the king did not fulfill his duties? Could rebellion be justified? How does one respond to authority? Why do we accept authority? What is the power of the state? What is the nature of the state? These are very fundamental questions that, you know, lay the basis of political science, freed from religion, as it were, as a secular subject. And therefore, Hobbes was the first philosopher to systematically talk about politics in that sense of the term, although you might argue that it was Aristotle. Hobbes was the first early modern philosopher to talk about politics in a very ordered, methodical sense, and therefore can justifiably be called the father of early modern political science. This is my first point. My second point is that Hobbes was extremely concerned with the concept of the material body, its functions, its mechanisms, and the way in which material things moved and were viewed, mechanics and optics. And he saw the entire society and human behavior, not in divine terms, but in terms of the body and its mechanisms, right? He saw entire society as a mechanism, the state as a mechanism. And therefore, it is very important to understand Hobbes's importance in divorcing political behavior of man from religion altogether, right? And therefore, this charge of atheism against him, but also the first real secular political scientist in the early modern age. That is where Hobbes's importance lies. Now, the other importance is Hobbes is asking very, very fundamental questions. If human beings act in a certain way politically, when I say act, I mean politically, why are they doing so? So it's not a question of how the state operates only. It's a question of why the state is necessary and what is human behavior that makes the state possible. Let's say it's asking a very fundamental question. How do we behave? And if we behave in this way, what is our human nature? And therefore, if this is our human nature, then how does one organize ourselves into the state? I mean, I mean, I mean, আমাদের প্রকৃতি কি রকম আমাদের প্রকৃতি যদি এরকম হয় তাহলে আমাদের কেন নিজেদেরকে স্টেটে অর্গানাইজ করতে হবে হাউ ওয়াই ডু উই নিড টু অর্গানাইজ ইট টু স্টেট সো টু কোয়েশ্চেনস হোয়াট ইজ দ্য স্টেট অফ नेचर এন্ড देयरफॉर व्हाट ইজ দ্য नेचर অফ দ্য স্টেট ইউ সি দিস লজিক্যাল মুভমেন্ট in Hobbes. Right. Now, this is the introduction to Leviathan. Uh, 
I want you to carefully take a look at this. It's very, very, very suggestive passage. It says, imitating the rational and most excellent work of nature, man, for by art is created that great Leviathan called a commonwealth. Now, I will, of course, discuss this term Leviathan separately, but let me indicate here that Leviathan was a biblical monster, a biblical monster. So Leviathan in that sense is used as this gigantic body, all called the commonwealth. And you can immediately squarely place this within its context of the civil war and the rise of the commonwealth or state civitas many of you who did your icsc will remember studying civics as part of political science in your uh, class 9 and 10 textbooks so civitas how does one organize the state which is but an artificial man so again again this needs to be understood that Hobbes is talking about two kinds of men, natural men, which of course by birth you exist. And there's also something called artificial man, something which you create, something which is created by human beings. So this is an artificial man. The state is not natural. Right. We we do not we do not naturally think of a state. We are forced to think of it. It is an artificial creation of human beings. So immediately the first question is, if this is an artificial man, what is the need to create this artificial man? Right. So Hobbes is, you see, very consciously going from one question to the other through a distinct method. Though of greater stature and strength than the natural. Right. So saying that the state is monstrous, gigantic, and greater than any of us. We are all lesser than the state. Whose protection, for whose protection and defense it was intended. So what is, why is the question of the state arising? Why do we submit or create the state? We create it for protection. Right. And in which sovereignty is an artificial soul. Sovereignty is the state of agency over yourself, the power over yourself. As giving life and motion to the whole body, the magistrates, but in this case, Hobbes is talking about the sovereign who will control the commonwealth. So that is the soul, that is the essence of political science. Power, who controls power and what is the extent of his power? How does he exercise this power? In a matter of the political sciences, after all, if you do have a G here, is about the state of power, the exercise of power. So the magistrates and other officials are joints. Reward and punishment are the nerves. The wealth and the riches of the particular members are the strength. See how carefully Hobbes is building up the body of the state. So the soul is the sovereign. Sovereignty is the soul. What is the business of the state? Very important. The people's safety is its business. So the entire creation of this artificial state, its business is the safety of the people, the well-being of the people. And he says, counselors, are suggested are the memory, equity and laws, and artificial reason and will, concord, health. So the health of the state is in concord, peace, very important, peace and harmony. So sovereignty is the soul, business is safety, concord is health, sedition is sickness. So squarely you see why Hobbes is being called a royalist. Any form of rebellion is sickness. And how does the state die? That is where you can see the context very clearly. Civil war. 
civil war is death for the state because then the state collapses. There is no power to hold us together and we continually fight amongst yourself. And lastly, very importantly, how is the state formed? What makes the formation of the state possible? The facts and covenants by which the parts of this body politic were at first made, set together and united resemble that fiat or the let us make man pronounced by God in the creation. So very importantly, the essence of his science is this covenant that unites man with man. What is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement, a sealed agreement, which we agree to. Right. And that is where we will come to this question of the transference of rights. And what you now know in political science, most of you are aware of this term, social contract, social contract. Why are you all putting off your microphones, putting off your videos? Why are you not writing obscene messages in the chat box? Because all of you have agreed in a social contract that this is how the class will be conducted. Right. It is a social contract that is making me teach, that is making you sit still. And this social contract is at every point visible in your behavior. That is what is guiding us. Those are the laws. If you violate the law, but well, why will you sort of obey the law? Right. You obey the law, Hobbes says, because you fear that if you do not obey the law, the state will punish you, right? Therefore, this question is that naturally, would we like to obey the law? Are we law abiding citizens? Why does one obey the law? That's a very important question. What is the necessity of the state? Is it our rational uh, demand? Is it our natural demand? that we will organize ourselves into tribes and legal systems? Or is it something that is artificially created? This is the fundamental question that Hobbes is asking us. Right. What is the subject matter then? This is again from the introduction, which I think you should read, is first the matter of and the artificial both, which is man. So the state is not prior. The state is posterior, post. What is fundamental is human nature. Because of human nature, the state comes into being. Secondly, once you've considered human nature, by what covenants is it made? How is the state created? What is the contract that we agree to? What are the rights? in that contract and just power of the authority of the sovereign. This is the most important question, perhaps. What is the power, the extent of the power? Is it minimal? Is it maximum? Is it absolute? What is it that preserveth and dissolveth it? Why do we agree to the power of the sovereign? And when do we not agree to the power of the sovereign? What is the Christian commonwealth? This comes in almost as a kind of a afterthought. In fact, God is not a very important presence in Hobbes' Leviathan. And lastly, what is a kingdom of darkness? Here, Hobbes is not talking about a Christian commonwealth as such. He's talking about a commonwealth where you know everything has collapsed and where there is no contract. Right. It is therefore that we come to the subject of our discussion today, and that is the state of nature. Right. So what is the first law of the state of nature? What is the nature of man? See, this is the important question which is being asked throughout the 18th century. Hobbes says that my first proposition is that the state of nature is a state of equality. Right. So more or less all of us 
are equal to one another in physical strength and in mental abilities. There are exceptions, of course, but more or less all of us know the same things, can rationalize almost equally and are of equal strength. Right. In words, every man is naturally vulnerable to every other. It is important that a very pessimistic thought that if you want, if X, say, for example, in this class wants that, you know, I don't like Amritta much, <coughs> then he or she can jolly well slit my throat and I can do very little about it because he or she is more or less as strong as I am. Then comes a very important concept. The state of nature, therefore, is a state of war. Can he says all of us are equal. So first, law is that we are all equal. Second thing is that the resources are scarce. All of us want the same things. All of you want a good job. All of you want good food, a good house to live in. But resources are scarce. Therefore, what will we do? We'll all try to satisfy ourselves. That is another important law. That all of us desire the best for ourselves. So all of us want that. But because the resources are scarce, therefore, what will we do? If we are left to each other, we'll scramble for these resources. And if I have to get those resources, I have to push you out. Therefore, the state of nature, second law, is a state of war. What is the cause of that war? He says, competition, diffidence, and glory. All of us are competing with one another. All of us want praise from one another. All of us want glory for one another. Uh, um, for ourselves, sorry, not one another. All of us want to be the best. All of us want to be the top. The most powerful right and therefore what is the state of nature like it is a war of everyone against everyone right now let me go through this in greater detail taking Hobbes's text right i'm quoting from the text here nature hath made men so equal that though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body say for example think of the muscles of Salman Khan, who can floor 70 people in one go, and think of poor me, who would not stand up to his power, but more or less we all are equal. Or quicker in mind, somebody like Shokuntala Devi might do mathematics much faster than you and me, but by and large, on an average, all of us are equal. Yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man and man is not so considerable. As that one man can thereupon claim to himself any benefit to which another may not pretend as well as he. Right. So if somebody does something, you might well say, I could also do have done that. Or as to the strength of body, the weakest has the strength to kill the strongest, either by secret machination. You run a sword through him, fire a shot at him, and the weakest can kill the strongest, or by confederacy with others. So Five of you gang up of somebody and defeat him, thrash him, he will be able to do nothing. That are in the same danger with himself. So the same can be done to you also. As to the facility of the mind, the faculties of the mind, I find yet a greater equality amongst men than that of strength. The prudence is about experience. He says, you know, prudence comes from a greater experience. But more or less, all of us think in equal terms. Right. So first law is that state of nature is a state of equality. All of us are equal to the other. And therefore comes this question that state of nature is a state of conflict. Jogra. From this equality or ability arises the equality of hope in attaining of our ends. All of you are right now thinking of getting a good job, a good life, right? And therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, but there is one post, 
which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. So you become rivals, right? Your natural impulse is to compete. And in the way to their end, endeavor to destroy or subdue one another, right? So to get that, you will push somebody else, kill somebody else, harm somebody else. And from thence it comes to pass that where an invader hath no more to fear than another man's single power, if one plant, sow, build, or possess a convenient seat, others may probably be expected to come prepared with forces united to dispossess and deprive him, not only of the fruit of his labor, but also of his life or liberty. So you have built something up. You have farmed a piece of land. But three of us decide that, look, he has that field. He has that crop. We will go and sort of take it away from him. And because we are equal in power to him, we might defeat him and take it away. So there is no incentive for him to create something. Right. And the invader again is in like danger of another. So I sort of steal the crop and somebody steals it from me in turn. So what are the three causes of quarrel? First, competition. Second, diffidence. And third, glory. So the first, competition maketh men invade for gain. The second, for safety. All of us want to be safe. So we will kill our enemies. The third for reputation. The first uses violence to make themselves master of other men's persons, wives, children, and cattle. The second to defend them. And the third for trifles as a word, a smile, a different opinion, and any other sign of undervalue, either direct or in their persons by their reflection, in their kindred, the friends, their nation, their profession, or their name. <coughs> and yes, you go and slap that person. Right. Or become his enemy. Same with nations. Somebody harms us, we in turn will harm, try to harm them. Therefore, we are, Hobbes says, always in a state of quarrel. All of us are not at peace. We are, therefore, what Hobbes calls in a state of continuous war. Bellum omnium contra omnis. A war of everyone against everyone. There's always a war of everyone against everyone. Hereby it is manifest that we are in a state called war. For war consistent, war manik. War is not only fighting, physical fighting, physical battle, killing. War, he says, is that state of mind of every man against, uh, I'm sorry, wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. That war is not just, you know, physical battle, but the willingness or mental state to be always ready for conflict. And therefore, the notion of time is in the nature of the weather. For the nature of foul weather lies not in a shower of two of rain, but an inclination there two of many days together. But I am perpetually depression. Depression not in the sense of you know, mental depression, but in the state of a clouded atmosphere where all of us are continuously ready to fight one another, even if we do not fight. So you know that he can harm me. I know that you can harm me. And you know that I can harm you. So we do not trust. We do not have peace. We do not therefore create because we know that our creation might be taken away. But the known disposition here too, during all the time, there is no assurance to the contrary. All other time is peace. So when we know that we are secure, we know that nothing evil will happen to us that there is a force that can control any violence against us, then we are at peace. This is very important. How does one overcome the state of nature and move towards a state of peace? Right. 
And therefore comes the climactic part of this passage. This is what you will read for your exams. Uh, this up till this part. The next part is, of course, something which we'll talk about uh, uh, more extraneous, extraneously. Is whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, wherein men live without other security than their own strength in such a condition. Jodi erokomi abustha hoy, ki amra shabshomay bhoy pachchi, je amader onno ke mere fele debe, shabshomay chhator ko thakte hoyche, je amader kichu kothi hoye jabe kina. In that state, there is no place for industry. Will not create anything because we know that it will be taken away. Because the fruit thereof is uncertain. Consequently, no culture of the earth. No earth, uh, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea. Therefore, no trade. Because after all, if the trader has to sort of keep his money, then he must have peace. No instruments of moving, no commodious buildings, no knowledge of the face of the earth. No account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. Right? Therefore, it is a total collapse. It's where every man is enemy to every man and war might break out any moment. Thick. This is what the civil war was. This is what a time of civil war was. Continuous conflict between men. Distrust, mistrust, loss of trade, loss of commercial activity. And therefore, continual fear and danger of violent death. Conflict might break out in any part of the country at any moment of time. Or between two houses, between two mahallas, between two, two localities. And therefore, what is the life of man like? The life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. I will be repeating in your, the, the course of your classes. Life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Eta Huche Hobbes' description of the state of nature. So, what is what are the basic precepts? Let me sort of once again sort of summarize for you. One is that the state of nature is a state of equality. We are all equal in terms of body and mind. Two, therefore, the state of nature is a state of conflict. Right? What are the causes for, of conflict? One is power. Two is diffidence. Three is glory. Therefore, what is the state of nature ultimately like? It is a state, a state of war, of perpetual conflict of one man against another, of all men against other men. Or the state of in which we are ready for conflict. And therefore, what is the life of man like? It is a state of perpetual fear and anxiety. Hobbes is creating the state of perpetual fear and anxiety. And therefore, what is life like, human nature like, is nasty, brutish, and short. Human nature, therefore, according to Hobbes, is pathetic. It is always marked by conflict. It is always marked by the readiness to battle one another. It is nasty. It is poor. And therefore, it is short because it might be ended in any way. Right. Let me quickly move on to uh, what uh, Hobbes is talking about, in fact, in the state of nature, is uh, studying human psychology without any reference to summum bonum or the greatest good. So obviously, it's a very pessimistic view of human nature, isn't it? Right. And therefore, he's talking about what we'll call summum malum, right? That it is human nature is a state of great evil. But it is not a question of Christian evil. Please remember this very carefully, that it does not arrive from any malignancy or evil within us. There's no concept of moral or immoral. Right. He says it is because we are like this and that no God can allow us relief from this. 
it is man who has to adjust to this notion of human nature and man has to create an artificial source of power whereby he may be freed from this state of nature right and therefore who is the philosopher whom Hobbes is countering and Hobbes is therefore countering the foremost philosopher of the police of the person who suggested that man could stay in the city in an organized political life and that is the classical philosopher Aristotle what is Aristotle's thesis Aristotle's thesis is Aristotle wrote this treatise called politics where he says that human beings are naturally suited to life in a polis polis is an organized city and do not fully realize their natures unless they exercise the role of the citizen so we are suited we are naturally inclined towards organizing ourselves within the polis what is up saying no no absolutely not we are by nature greedy selfish we look after our self interests and therefore we will engage in conflict aristotle says we will organize ourselves hob says we will go in a state of conflict now these are the fundamental differences with uh, with hobbes with aristotle right so the naturally aristotle says the naturally or rather i'm sorry hobbes turns aristotle's claim on its head human beings are by nature unsuited to political life right so there's no natural self restraint they are ruthless and bloodthirsty they're not moderate and they are by nature aggressive in other words hob says no human being is above aggression and the anarchy that's the word anarchy that goes with it right let me come back to another concept this concept of morality what is hob saying about morality and religion as such now is this therefore immoral the state of nature up says no there's nothing of morality there's no question of morality here because we are by nature like this therefore nothing can be unjust in the state of nature the notions of right and wrong justice and injustice have no place where there is no common power there is no law where no law no injustice force fraud justice and injustice and none of the faculties of body nor mind they are qualities that relate to men in society not in solitude so in solitude by yourself you are aggressive you do not believe in any morality the only morality that you believe in is you have to protect and preserve yourself that is what hobbes is saying that all of us at the end of the day want to protect and preserve ourselves therefore no property no dominion no mine and thine distinct but only that to be every man's that he can get or that kere kure ja paro niye nao nije ke preserve kor and for so long as you can keep it ebong seta rokkhona bekkhon koro karon onno keu eshe seta kere nebe and thus much for the ill condition which man by mere nature is actually placed in with a possibility to come out ebar prashno ta hocche the next question that hobbes is going to ask is therefore if this is such a poor pathetic condition nasty brutish and short what can we do about it and the answer according to hobbes is the social contract and that we shall discuss tomorrow but in the meanwhile let me when we are in this concept of the state of nature let me briefly talk about what are the responses to hobbes right the state of nature to hobbes akrokom bhabe bolle is saying that look this is how our state of nature is nasty brutish and short it is marked by equality and conflict it is marked by self preservation it is marked by violence now the philosopher who answers hobbes is actually john locke and locke is writing uh two treatises of government 
and in the second treatise of civil government, Locke is suggesting that men are free in the state of nature, and I'm quoting Locke, men are free to order their actions and dispose their persons as they think fit within the laws of nature. And the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, and that law is reason. What Hobbes is saying that men are by natural, irrational, and conflict free. Locke is saying that man is by the state of nature rational, and therefore they will maintain peace with one another. <coughs> In Hobbes's state of nature, the state is a state of war. In Locke's state of nature, the state of nature is a state of peace and reason. difference Hobbes bolchen amra by nature anarchic. Locke bolchen amra by nature rational. And therefore, we are born with this reason that no one ought to harm one another in his life, liberty, and or property. Hobbes bolchen jodi chera dao, tale amra for three reasons. A lock bull chin to the Chiradao, Amra Shokole, Ake on net property, respect Kurucho. Right. So these are two very contrary ways of approaching the state of nature. And therefore, Hobbes is taking almost a binary position to that of lock. Now, the two other people who talk about Locke's state of nature is, of course, Montesquieu in his Spirit of the Laws. Montesquieu also takes a contrary state to Hobbes and suggests that, you know, uh, human beings organize themselves according to their own laws and uh, Therefore, a state of nature is a state of laws. Right. Rousseau, of course, suggests that the state of nature is a state of blankness. Blank slate. We are by, not, by nature not violent. We are by nature not rational. But whatever society determines, we follow. Right. And he says that uh, <clears throat> there is no life outside society. People were neither good nor bad, but born as a blank slate. And society and the en environment influence which way we learn. Jekarone, Rousseau great tract uh, Emil, where Emil is put on an island and conditioned. Right. Ja Emil ke shekhana hobe, Emil ke shayibhabe behave korbe. So there is no, there is no state of nature. But there is only the state state of being, as it were, which society creates on you. That is what Rousseau is suggesting in ML. Right. And therefore, Rousseau is suggesting that serious conflict is something that society imposes rather than human nature naturally being violent or quarrelsome. The final philosopher whom I'll talk about very briefly of the Enlightenment is David Hume. And Hume talks about, Hume's treatise is called a treatise of human nature. This is 1739. So almost uh, 80 years after Hobbes has published his treatise, says that human beings, Hume says, are naturally social. Hobbes has said they are naturally asocial. Hume is saying that human beings are naturally social and that they have this capacity of sensibility and sympathy. We understand rather than we be enemies. And that it is utterly impossible by men to remain in any considerable time in that savage condition, Hume writes, which precedes society. But that is very first state and situation may justly be esteemed social. This, however, hinders not they're extending reasoning the supposed to the state of nature. And he suggests also that of the origin of justice and property, mankind is 
universally benevolent, right? So what we have is quite a number of swirling ideas of human nature. Or that manushet chorithro ta kiroko, prokriti ta kiroko. Hobbes bolche that manushet chorithro or prokriti by nature is antisocial, is by nature he is selfish. He thinks about his preservation. By nature, he is violent, nasty, brutish. Locke is suggesting by nature, man is rational and therefore social, and therefore he will organize himself and by nature will not engage in conflict. Men's, men are by nature natural, uh, I'm sorry, peaceful and rational. Hume Abar Bolchen, Rousseau Bolchen, there is no state of nature as it were. State of nature is a blank slate, and state of nature is created by society. So there is actually no state of nature. Whatever nature you get is the nature that society impinges upon you. And finally, Hume is suggesting that the state of nature by itself is social and empathetic. Or that amra shawabotui ake onner proti shomobati. Right. So these are the various ideas which are swirling around. But what is important for Hobbes is the next question. If this is the state of nature, how can, and if the state of nature is a state of war, continuous war of every man against every man, then how can we get out of this? How can we arrive at peace? And therefore comes the question of social contract and the state. A question which we shall come back to in our next class. What therefore is going to be the nature of the state? So I think I have spoken for a considerable amount of time and I will stop my recording right now. If there is any question, I'll be of course 